G'day, uh, I'm here with uh, Bjorn Kimmich. Oh, is that how you pronounce it, Bjorn? It's it's Bjorn Kimmich, but uh, I take everything. It's 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 so totally fine. I've seen worse on Starbucks mugs, so. It's sort of like with my surname. As long as all the letters are roughly there and roughly the right order, it's all good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Bjorn won an OWASPI award this year for um, most in uh, the best innovator at OWASP, and I think he well deserved it for all of the work he's done over a very long period of time on OWASP Juice Shop. So Bjorn, um, can you just briefly describe how you got going in AppSec and the genesis of uh, Juice Shop itself, and um, then maybe we can talk about some of the newer features of Juice Shop. And I might have yeah, you sure. about some. So um, yeah, basically in, in AppSec, I got going via the developer path, basically, right? So, so I started developing software and uh, worked in, in software development and architecture. And then over a period of time, somehow became the security expert for a few web applications at my company. And that kind of evolved then into me giving trainings to developers about the OWASP top 10 back then 2007 edition was I think the first trainings I did. I did and then 13 and 17 and so on. So um, yeah, that, that's basically how it, how it all started. And uh, yeah, during, during my trainings, I, I noticed that I was relying on third-party vulnerable apps for, for exercises, right? Mm. Um, so for example, using the budget store or some of the available, let's say small vuln apps that came from, from vendors of tools, right? Which were mm. more like mm. demo demo applications for the tool features. And I yeah. used those and it worked quite fine, but at some point I just wanted a bit more sophisticated things to play with for the for the training participants. And that's basically where the juice shop idea came from. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, and also I, I was not so happy that all the existing Vuln apps were mostly server-side rendered mm -hmm. stuff. So PHP, Java server pages, et cetera. So that's that's why I I'm, and I never did any Angular and Node.js uh, development before. So that was basically a nice nice way to to learn that, and that's basically where the original Juice Shop came from. I'm really glad you did the Node.js version because, quite frankly, uh, it's now the predominant uh, commercial programming language, and um, we're seeing a lot of adoption. So having something that is obviously insecure, but written in Node.js shows that it can happen in any language. Yeah. And I mean, so, originally I'm, I'm more, more a Java guy, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it took some time for me to get rid of my uh, thinking in types and classes and everything. To, mm -hmm. but, but by now I really, I'm really happy using JavaScript actually. And if you don't do so many mistakes like I do in the juice shop, then it's it's even quite quite good to work with, right? But you really have to be careful with what you actually use. Yeah, one of the things that I saw a few years ago was a um, a talk by someone who was showing how eval and some of the things that go under the hood in Node.js cause race conditions and um, synchronization as, uh, issues. Um, does Juice Shop have any of those where you've got like things happening in multi-threaded, but Node sort of doing things under the hood? We have we have some multi, no, not really multi-threaded, but uh, we, we have a race condition issue with our, I think it's with the um, anti-automation for for some for some of the functionality that is that is broken, uh, mm -hmm. and we also have an eval in some place where we where we actually accept. An arbitrary string that is then converted into JavaScript and executed by Eval, um, mm -hmm. and of course that's not a good idea. And even our our chatbot, I think, is also using Eval somewhere under the hood and uh, shouldn't because you can kill the entire application with with that thing. I've been recently getting into TypeScript and JavaScript development. Um, my game has a third-party tool called Elite BGS. Uh, for Elite Dangerous, and it's written in very obtuse uh, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Its main function that does all the hard work is 1300 lines long and not strongly typed. And I, I worry tremendously about security vulnerabilities within it. So I've been trying to convert it to TypeScript and that is a nightmare. So 
well done for getting so many lessons done in just plain old JavaScript, basically. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, we did uh, uh, no, this year, I think it, it was, we, we actually converted JuiceShop, um, the backend also into TypeScript, but mm -hmm. only the, it's, it's compiled now uh, or transpiled now, but it's still the original JavaScript code in most places. So that's, there's a big pile of work in front of us to really make it into TypeScript. Where, okay. yeah. So that's that's a kind of a, a, a daunting task in front of us, I would say. <laughs> well, once I've finished, uh, I've finished with the top 10, uh, the ASVS 5.0 is coming up. I might be able to help a little bit there. Maybe, maybe a little bit. I, I won't promise anything. So you sent to me a couple of things that have been improved in Juice Shop recently. Do you want to go over some of those things? It's like, you know, yeah, I, I thought maybe maybe it's worth mentioning a few of the of the things which I consider most innovative in in Juice mm -hmm. Shop, especially compared to to other existing uh, um, vulnerable applications. So, for example, one thing we have for quite some time already is a, a, a theming uh, option. So you basically can override the entire UI of the Juice Shop with your own colors, with your own logos, with your own Twitter account links, with your own even entire product inventory. So you can basically get rid of all the juices and the juice related products. And you could put in your own, I don't know, if you are a bookstore, for example, you could put in all, all kinds of books, right? And that that is, a, the, the idea originally was to, to make it um, more immersive, especially for, for IT managers, if you do a demo with, with, uh, with such a vulnerable application, because mm. they can much more relate to to something they know because it looks like it's from their own domain, right? And not not just this, oh, there are funny juices and what's the point? I mean, developers mostly like it in the default mode and find it funny, but uh, especially when you present to management, it's much better to to have it look like it's actually from, from your own corporate space and look and feel, and that's, that's really neat. Mm -hmm. I must admit, the only time I've ever made use of that functionality is to get rid of the, um, you know, fork me on GitHub, and uh -huh. I, I actually yeah. do like the the cookie message it gives. I, I left that alone, but um, <laughs> yeah, you can but, even overwrite the cookie banner message. Yes, and the good thing it, is, Jusha provides some uh, some example um, templates in different styles, so it's quite yeah. easy to actually create your own. So one of the things when I've been an instructor in the past and I've used Juice Shop um, is the um, flags. And you mentioned that there was an anti-cheat mechanism that's come into it, um, which is actually quite a good idea because I've had people do the wrong thing there. <laughs> yeah, this is something we, we added um, quite recently. So the Juice Shop is now measuring the time that it takes between you solving uh, the hacking challenge before and the, hacking, the next one, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And it then calculates how likely it is that you that you didn't really actually solve it manually, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just run a script or if you just run our our end-to-end -end test suite over the juice shop, then mm -hmm. you basically have all challenges solved in ten minutes or something, and that's just not realistic. So whenever you solve two unrelated challenges too quickly behind each other, then uh, it basically gives you a higher cheat score between zero and one, and uh, basically piles that up to to a total cheat rating. But the, the user actually never gets to see that. So you only see that in the server logs, and you can um, send this kind of information to a webhook so that if you, if you are in a classroom or, or training setup, then mm -hmm. uh, basically the trainer could actually see, okay, how how does it look? How many participants might actually be just using the, I don't know, the existing solutions from the internet and just clicking them through. So, and we, we kind of, we, we, I mean, it's not, it's not crazy sophisticated, but it is already able to, to, um, to determine like related challenges, right? Mm. For example, there's one challenge, um, which, which triggers all the time because it just says you triggered an error that is not well handled and juice shop yes. does that all the time so you typically get two challenges solved in one quite quickly and we make sure that you don't accidentally get cheat score for that so that's that's kind of kind of a nice nice gimmick 
not, I'm not sure if it's reused in practice by anyone yet, really, but um, I'm, I'm happy for any feedback on, on that. Um, so I do use the, um, this, I, I won't give the game away, but there is a SQL injection that allows you to log in. And mm -hmm. then from there, you can do a cross site scripting. And I have both of those in my browser's history. Um, and so I can complete both of those challenges very quickly. Would it actually discover me doing that? If you have them in the browser history and basically just repeat them, um, then it, it would trigger. But the thing is that Juice Shop remembers the challenges you already solved, right? Ah. So if you, if you then, uh, if you, for example, then restart your server, mm -hmm. um, then all the challenges will be solved again automatically, but this will mm -hmm. not trigger any, any cheat detection. So basically the, the cheating score only happens when you solve a challenge for the first time, not when it's restored from, uh, from a cookie. So, yeah. uh, but in well, your case, it might actually trigger if you just use a completely blank new instance and then just run stuff from the browser history. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, autofill uh, does its thing and I go between this screen and this screen. I don't want to give the game away because I know that some people don't like looking at the cheat sheet version of the G Shop solutions. They want to mm -hmm. solve it for themselves. So I won't go into the actual thing I'm trying to do. Let's just say that it's faster to log in using the SQL injection than it is to actually log in. It is. Yes. <laughs> un un unless, unless you use our also relatively new demo account. So you can just log in with a username demo and password demo. And then you basically have a, have an account that already has a shipping address and a credit card, so you can easily use it to show the shopping process as well. So that was that was something that we missed uh, because it was quite tedious to show how the actual shopping goes if you had to register everything and set everything up. So demo demo is the new. Okay, that's easy. Uh, yeah. um, it's also good to show how um, pre-populated lists from like um, the secure payloads um, project or whatever actually can help you log in uh, using well-known password combinations. Um, one of the things that I used to use before I got onto Juice Shop was the Security Shepherd project, and mm -hmm. a lot of its um, lesson names in the source code are random MD5 function names. I understand you've got some coding challenges in the Juice Shop now. Um, how did you avoid having to have random um, method names, or did you actually end up having random method names? I mean, they're just trying to do it to avoid cheating in their own way. Yeah. But it then no, became we almost don't, we, impossible. No, we don't. No. I mean, in in the end, um, the the Juice Shop is 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 storing the progress that you make in a in a cookie, and it's basically just a list of the challenge IDs in some obfuscated form. So you actually mm -hmm. have to invest a little bit of time to, to hack that. But if mm -hmm. you want, you can, right? But our cheat detection would then determine if you actually um, are too quick with, with that. So that's, yeah, but, but in the end, I mean, Juice Shop was originally made as a, as a, as a kind of single player mm -hmm. application. So if you cheat, then you basically cheat yourself and nobody notices and this this cheat detection was really more for classroom setup so when you teach at university for example and um, if, if someone really sneakily wants to cheat they can right um, by pretending that the challenges were already solved but then again i mean they probably didn't learn anything if they if they do that so yeah, but you as, you, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, the the, the coding challenges that's actually mm -hmm. something that is really new in the Juice Shop it was just released a, a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. with the Google Summer of Code for for this year, and that's uh, that's basically that uh, when you solved a hacking challenge or twenty six of our one hundred hacking challenges have an associated coding challenge now, so you get a um, you can can view a code snippet with the actual vulnerability. Um, and that is not something that is that is coming from some static file that's actually loaded from the server of the juice shop, right? So it's the actual source code that you have uh, that you see there, and we clean up everything that that would um, immediately spoiler the solution, like all the challenge checks and and stuff that happens also in the code, right? That's all not visible, and then you have to select the line of code or lines. That you think are re responsible for the for the code issue or for the security issue, 
And when you successfully did that, you switch over to a different tab where you get three or four uh, options presented, how you would actually fix this. And you pick one and then you submit that. And uh, yeah, if you're right, you get like extra points and uh, more, more green color on the scoreboard, which is qu quite nice. And we're, we're currently extending it um, to, to show you some explanations after you submitted a wrong answer, for example, to explain a little bit why that wasn't the right one. So it's a bit more trying to teach a little bit more about uh, secure coding in, in a practical way, let's say. I must admit, one of the classes I led was the JavaScript developers, and I asked them to actually clone the repo and run it locally mm -hmm. and fix the code. Um, that didn't go too well. I think, honestly, so many people are unaware of the best ways of addressing JavaScript vulnerabilities. Uh, actually having something that guides you down the correct path or provides an option of what if one of the better paths would actually be very helpful. Um, I ended up a lot of the time with like 20 minute labs taking nearly an hour and most people not getting a solution. So um, I didn't do that again. <laughs> Sounds yeah. like it's time to revisit. <laughs> Now, I mean, we, we, we considered um, doing it like, okay, here's the broken code, now fix it. And yeah. then on, on the Jewshop side, trying to find out if the fix actually worked, but that that is just too risky because there's 10,000 possible ways how this can go wrong and someone mm -hmm. might make it even worse. And if we then execute this code, then all kinds of bad stuff might actually happen. So. That's that, that's why we actually went down the here are like four options. Pick the one that is that you think is the best, and then mm -hmm. for for some of the challenges, we have a few more like funny options and some re really ridiculous ones. Um, but there are also several challenges where it's a little bit harder to actually see the difference, and it's more subtle what the actual wor well working fix is and what is what is nonsense, right? Yeah, I mean, I I learned a lot from. Um looking at the um, um, G-Shop code. And in fact, I ended up using Protractor for my own um, purposes, mm -hmm. Dif a different type of purpose than end-to-end -end testing, but certainly um, having exposure to some of these end-to-end -end testing tools and an example of how it can be used is tremendous. And I really, really do appreciate that the end-to-end -end tests are there. Um, yeah, and, and, one, and, and we are only using those for, for actually testing the hacking part, right? So we, and we're not even using it for the functionality itself, only for the hacking. But that is really, I think that was really a worthwhile investment, the, writing mm. these end-to-end -end tests, because it's it, it, it now allows us to do code changes all over the place, and we can still be pretty sure that the challenges still work, right? So that we don't accidentally fix a vulnerability or something by doing a an unwanted I don't know dependency update or anything and that happened in the past right so that someone yeah. just by accident removed our needed vulnerable library right so and mostly that person was me so and so let's talk about that how do people get involved with Jewshop you mentioned TypeScript conversion uh, a lot of work to be done there technical debt um, what how can someone who's interested in Jewshop how do they start? What what is the best way of getting involved? The easiest way is to to take a look, of course, uh, at our GitHub issues. Then you immediately see a few which we marked as a good first issue or help needed. Sometimes both. So the help needed ones are mostly stuff which is a bit tricky mm -hmm. um, for 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 us uh, ourselves, and the good first issues are perfectly fine typically for for new new contributors so that's that's mm. that's one way and i would i would actually recommend to to just visit the the um the website and there's a link to our uh, to our online documentation which is technically an ebook that you can also also download and there is an entire chapter about code contribution mm -hmm. including a um um code uh, one um, a code base 101 chapter so it basically gives you a, a short overview of what what parts of uh, code are there in, in the juice shop right the back end the front end and and several other things with short examples and a little bit of gi giving you a little bit of overview 
yeah. uh, how to actually start. And otherwise, I mean, you can always just uh, contact me on Slack or Gitter, and uh, I'm I'm happy to help you find something to do. Mm. And and if you if you I mean if if a contributor actually wants to do more, like we had in the past as well, um, right? Not not just single GitHub issue. We're also happy to support, I don't know, bachelor theses and master theses and stuff that are around the juice shop, right? So mm -hmm. if, if it involves a little bit of coding for us as well. So one of the things that we've got is the OS top 10 data um, set has 515,000 apps in it. And part of that is that we've got a, like more or less a histogram of all of the CWEs that have been reported over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, it's it could always be used to identify new topics for new lessons. Um, like if you haven't got a lesson on a particular topic, it might be very useful because I think yes. the, the ASVS version five level one will be strongly influenced from this data set, even though we collected it for the top 10. Um, I noticed that when I was instructing that sometimes the documentation was out of date and the images were from old versions and sometimes the solutions didn't quite work the way that the documentation did. I think one of the ones that I'd encourage people to get involved is um, helping to update the documentation with a pull request would actually help everybody and it also introduces you how does this actually work, what's it doing under the hood um, and making sure the solutions are good in the back as well. Yeah, I mean. Um... We, we we just we just uh, uh, like yesterday I think we had a pull request for a very small fix to uh, to one of our coding challenges where we where we um, offered um, uh, some solutions right for for possible solution for a NoSQL injection but mm -hmm. the the actual fix that we provided was wrong right so the, it wouldn't even have fixed the issue but mm -hmm. someone actually noticed that and sent a pull request to fix that that uh, fixing option, which is which is great, right? And uh, that's that's e even so such small requests uh, or pull requests for for uh, are always uh, worth a, a, a pack of stickers to us. So that's basically one of our, I think, uh, unique selling points that when you do you when you get your first pull request merged in the juice shop, then you get a a few stickers and postcards and stuff. Uh, so maybe that motivates someone as well so if you mm -hmm. I, I've, I've sent like 50 plus letters with with stickers out over the last years so i actually have some envelopes over there that need to go into the uh post to give people their um their membership badges um ah. i need to get this done because i keep on forgetting to do it and i need to do it um, yeah, I, I, I will them. also always pile up uh, these envelopes and then, yeah, but I, I typically tell people it, it might take a few months until you get yours, but they will, they will come, come along. I'll try and get those into the post before the August dateline on them gets too stale. Um, so what's up, what's coming up in the future for Geoshop? What's, what's your plans? And what, uh, anything new coming? Um, yeah, ba I mean, basically the, the coding challenges were just the big new thing and we're currently working on a few improvements to those mm -hmm. to make them more, feel a bit more natural. Um, also improving um, for ourselves some, we would like to have some way to, to find out if, if the, the actual vulnerable code became mm -hmm. inconsistent with the provided fixes because those are static files, right? And mm -hmm. if, if you refactor the vulnerable code, then they don't match anymore. Mm -hmm. But we are, we, are, we are looking into some, some way to find this, find out how, how big the difference between um, those code snippets are, but that's a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. And other than that, at the moment, there's mostly, um, mostly some, some migration work to be done. So we are on Angular 11 right now and, 12 is out, I think 13 is almost out or even is already. So there's mm. some update here. Then we have this TypeScript conversion. Um, yeah, so I think now is, is, a, is, a, is a phase where we try to stabilize things again a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I'll actually let the let the whole test automation stuff slip a little bit. So our test coverage is, I think, down to eighty six percent or something. So mm -hmm. that needs to go up a little bit. Yeah, but uh, crazy new things at the moment. Now we we basically uh, fired all our guns already, and then uh, have to have to reload with some fresh ideas. I tell you what, the favorite. Um challenges that I like my advanced students to pass is looking at the Twitter feed for the current discount code and then how to exploit mm -hmm. that. Only a few of them can do it, but um, I love little surprises like that. I really do. Yeah, and with, with the dis with the discount code, I mean, there's like three different ways how, how you can actually solve that, right? So, mm -hmm. and uh -huh. from, from brute force to actually reverse engineering how the codes are done uh, that's that's mm -hmm. also one of my personal favorites because it has so many different angles how you can can do it and especially in classroom setups it's very nice if one student does it one way and someone else does it exactly the other way and mm -hmm. they both actually realize okay it, it it's it's kind of a matter of taste for the attacker right if you have so many vulnerabilities mm -hmm. um, that can be exploited in multiple angles then they will just pick their favorite one and will be done with it. So. Yeah. There is a challenge. If they solve that challenge, there's more codes than just what's available in the Twitter feed. So it can be actually a little bit helpful um, to yeah. solve one of the challenges. I'm trying to avoid telling people exactly what they need to do to solve this challenge, because when you solve it, it's very it's satisfying. <laughs> yeah. And I must admit, I haven't solved all of the challenges in G Shop, so there's even room for people who've got tons of experience to uh, learn something from G Shop. There's even a few that I haven't haven't really solved myself, like server side request forgery. I'm 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 pretty sure I never did that manually myself. So, <laughs> but I well, also didn't I also didn't write the challenge, so that, that might be the reason. The main reason is you do need a computer that's reachable from the internet to have your payload so you can bounce it off um, off that thing it can be a little bit challenging to test ssrf if you're not set up to do so um, orange Sasai, who did the ssrf chapter in the os top 10 2021 mm -hmm. has some great resources on how to test for this and um, we will try to get the cheat sheet updated um, to encourage people to test better um, it is a if you've never seen it tested before, it can be like magic. Um, but yeah, we absolutely need more people to test it. Now that it's in the OS top 10, there's no excuse. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, but okay. I, I mean, as, as, SSRF and CSRF are the, the, let's say, the tougher challenges to actually implement if you are just, if you just have the, the vulnerable app and, and you don't know what what other resources the the user might actually have to exploit those so we actually had to had to make those a little bit i think they feel a little bit weird some somewhat especially the the cross site request forgery because it relies on some third party page where you can just run code run html javascript code mm -hmm. uh, i mean that's that's also something where i would actually love to to see some improvements or maybe at some point these kind of challenges that just need to be removed. That's that's of course also an option because we have 100 now. Once we have mm -hmm. 101, I'm happy to remove at least one other challenge because I don't want to drop under the 100 mark anymore. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, there are some challenges which actually could could be removed because they they are they are a little bit over the top by today's standard. Well, it's. Compared to when I got going in penetration testing back in 2000, uh, sorry, my first stuff was in 1998. Um, but in 2001, when I started working on the developer guide, things were so simple. Every app had SQL injection, every app had cross site scripting. No one had any CRSF. We didn't really know about CRSF back then either, but it, every app had it. Um, it is a lot harder now to actually get decent exploits that are just easy to find. Um, yeah. But at the same time, some of the oldies, maybe, yeah, you don't need six or seven versions of SQL injection. Maybe you could just prove the point with one or two here or there. Yeah. Um, obviously, OWASP, this is going to be like the last question. 
Um, OS has just had its 20th anniversary. Um, where do you see the application security field going uh, over the next 20 years? What would you like to see solved? Over the next 20 years? Oh, I don't know. Not, not, not for the next 20 years. I, I would actually love to see the, 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 scale, the scaling problem solved because the, the number of developers will always be much higher than the number of security experts. So in my opinion, the only way to, to solve this is to make the developers the security experts yeah. um, or at least make sure that they have enough security awareness to avoid some of the worst things that could possibly happen. And I hope that the juice shop actually contributes to that by being a fun way for developers to actually learn about security issues and playing around with it and now even seeing the vulnerable code and learning how to how to avoid certain certain typical coding mistakes so i think i think that's that's the main the main issue the the being able to to work with developers together on security issues and make sure that they can do most of the things on their own without mm -hmm. asking a security expert in their company or uh, on the internet mm -hmm. um, because it's the security folks will always be outnumbered right? and yeah. it's not yeah. and just looking at stack overflow and hoping that you can copy the secure solution that just doesn't that pattern just doesn't work right there's too much bad stuff on stack overflow so well, that's one of the things that I'm trying to get is more people involved in Stack Overflow answering the questions correctly so that the right answers bubble to the top of the, of the first few clicks you might see. Um, but that requires a lot of us to participate in Stack Overflow and many of us don't have the time. Yeah, it's still, um, it's still the scalability problem then, yes. I'm really hoping that um, more people re like adopt React and Vue um, because that solves a lot of cross-site scripting. So if you're into... And obviously, the newer versions of Angular also do this too. Yes. They auto escape, and I think a lot of that bug class fixes are due to frameworks. Um, one of the things that I do notice is that if you use analogies, I, I think the building co the building uh, profession, the average apprentice does not know much about how to build a house nor what needs to be built. Whereas a general contractor with many years experience will know how to build like the jack studs and everything that actually makes the house solid and won't fall apart. Mm. But then they also then know when it's time to go get some engineering. And that's the sort of application security layer that we're looking at. So I do believe that you're absolutely right that developers need to learn over time what are the good patterns for security and then understand, okay, I've reached my limit. I need to talk to someone now. Yep. Okay. And in the best case, of course, in a, in, a, in a cooperative way and not not seeing the security folks as your antagonists because they always say you are not allowed to do this and that, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, the computer says no is not a good way to run a, your life. Um, developers, yes. won't, they will not come to you if you're constantly telling them that the code is ugly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, Bjorn, thank you so much for being with us today. This will go up on uh, YouTube shortly, and uh, I look forward